Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast with Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. Each episode will feature a new guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today's episode of the Psychology Podcast is brought to you by Bombas. We're going to hear a little bit about them and their philanthropic ways later, but right now we're really excited to be speaking with our guest, the eminent social psychologist Roy Baumeister. Roy is a Francis Epi's professor of psychology at Florida State University. He's authored more than 500 publications and has co-authored or edited almost 30 books. He's one of the most highly cited psychologists of all time. It's an honor to have you on the show today, Roy. Well, bless your heart, but it's no honor. I'm glad to be here. Great. The amount of studies that you've done and topics that you study, we could chat for the rest of our lives. <laughs> so let's, let's start with, how did you get interested in psychology? Oh, well, circuitous path. I went to college to study math because I was good at that in high school. And then higher math seemed kind of weird. Uh, those are the hippie days and uh, everybody talked about relevance and profundity. So I thought, well, why didn't I study philosophy and religion and grapple with the big questions? And then it turned out psychology had some interesting approaches to those. I, uh, I was struck, I was reading moral philosophy while I was over as a foreign student in Heidelberg. And, you know, the philosophers grapple with the ideas of right and wrong. And I happened to read some of Freud's book. So we said, well, let's look at how people actually get their ideas of right and wrong rather than analyzing the concepts. And I thought, well, that's, that's an interesting approach. You could take kind of a scientific way of uh, addressing and solving some of the same problems. So that kind of got me hooked. Wow. So Freud got you hooked. And, you know, the kind of topics that Freud studied, did they interest you? Well, these were his books on society and human nature and morality, good and evil. So uh, those were fascinating topics. You know, the clinical side of Freud uh, was less uh, exciting to me. Right. Uh, yeah. Freud did have a nice career studying people with mental illness and then talking about basic human nature. And, and I, I liked, I thought for a while I would do that, but you're not, you can't do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> if you want to talk about uh, normal people, you have to actually study normal people. That's right. Uh, so Freud's little bridge there was burned a long time ago, but it, it worked for him. Now, what was your dissertation, your doctoral dissertation about? Oh, goodness. Uh, so back in the 1970s, the uh, self-esteem uh, movement was just starting to take off. People were studying a, a lot of social psychology processes, thinking eh, maybe uh, changes in self-esteem were going on, that you, you get a failure experience and your self-esteem goes down, and that's what affects your behavior. I was a little skeptical of that. I thought maybe we care more about what other people think of us than what we think of ourselves. So... There was just a little bit of discussion of differences in that. So in my dissertation, I tried giving people good or bad feedback about their personalities. It has had been done for a while in the guise supposedly of manipulating self-esteem. Of course, nobody checked whether it actually changed self-esteem or not. They just assumed it back then. Uh, so what I did is give those same things either in a public or a private setting. Either you're the only one who'll see this confidential information, this evaluation of you. Or I'm looking at it myself, I'm showing it to other people, and, and if it's just self-esteem, it should have the same effect, right? It's the same information having the same impact on how you appraise yourself. But it turned out, if you cut the evaluation confidentially, it really had very little effect. But knowing other people had seen it, that made a big, big difference. So this was the start of study of self-presentation, or what actually uh, you know, for me, it was the start. Uh, people had been talking about it for a, a while. It wasn't mainstream social psych, although gradually it caught on because lots of people started seeing, yes, yes, behavior really changes when other people are looking in ways that the same situation, the same information, the same cues don't change behavior if you're on your own. Sure. Was that classified under social psychology at that point? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. It was a social psychology dissertation and published in the Journal of Social Personality and Social Psychology. 
And so, uh, yes, that's what got my career started. Great. Yeah, you really countered a lot of the um, thinking at the time, especially in the media about self-esteem and, you know, the famous Saturday Night Live skit about looking in the mirror, right, and saying, by gosh, you know, I love me or something. <laughs> what did you find were some of the downsides of having too high of a self-esteem? I was positive on self-esteem for a long time. I thought it was a great thing to study and I, I, I worked on it, but I always pay extra attention to critical comments. And I remember the first few people saying, how come self-esteem doesn't really predict much that's important? And I, th- I was indignant. I thought, oh, it does predict important things in my laboratory. It works. But <laughs> I was looking at fairly specific kinds of responses. And so I started looking out at the more uh, broad-based studies of self-esteem, mostly things other people were doing. And yes, it often failed to deliver. So uh, gradually, I began to uh, question it and doubt it. I still feel a little bad about it. it Self-esteem was one of my first interests, and if it had done all the stuff we hoped it would do, I would have you know, been a been a big shot or something like that. But anyway, in terms of the downside of high self-esteem, I, over time I started to to look at the world in, in terms of trade-offs. That there are very few things that are unmitigated good or bad, and it goes against the way we think. A lot of people go into psychology and social science thinking they're going to change the world. This is the right way to be, and other ways are wrong. And, we just got to show people that this is what we should do. Over time, I've become much more oriented toward trade-offs. And so, yeah, there'll be some advantages to uh, high self-esteem, but some disadvantages too. One formulation that several of us uh, came to was that the benefits of self-esteem mostly come to yourself in that it feels good. It's nice to think you're a superior, competent being and so on. But the costs uh, are borne by the other people around you. If you've had a... Uh, romantic partner or a roommate or a co-worker or whatever with a very high self-esteem, you probably know what I mean. They can be a pain and a difficulty to deal with and they become very sensitive to criticism and so they feel more entitled. So, on, you know, just inflating self-esteem for its own sake, I think it contains a significant risks and leads into what later came to be known as, as narcissism, which is this unfounded sense of superiority and narcissism contributes to a lot of uh, higher aggression and you know, less tolerance of others and so forth. Self-esteem, high self-esteem is a mixed category and the effects are very different. There are people with high self-esteem who are simply good people, competent and moral and so on, and they know it. And so that's not so bad. There are other people though who just think they're a lot better than they are. Uh, so in them, high self-esteem uh, leads to defensiveness and aggressiveness and all sorts of negative risky outcomes. Right. So like unstable self-esteem versus I've seen that distinction in the literature. Yes, that's correlated with uh, the narcissism. They have the unstable high self-esteem. They, they want to think they're superior, but if somebody criticizes them or whatever, then their self-esteem drops uh, temporarily and they hate that. <laughs> that feeling mm-hmm. your self-esteem goes down is... Mm-hmm. Is, is quite a bad feeling. So the unstable ones become then hypersensitive. Is, is this person about to criticize me? And they lash out uh, very quickly when they, they think someone is being critical. And, and you know, that's part of what makes those people difficult to get along with. But the true high self-esteem, you know, people who just think they're wonderful and nothing phases them, the stable high self-esteem doesn't matter. Good day, bad day, success, failure, you still think you're great. Well, They're not uh, aggressive or anything. They think of them as sort of floating through life on a cloud of their own wonderfulness. Uh, Nothing's bothering them. So why should they get upset? (laughs) Sure. And this topic has kind of been part of a larger investigation you've had on the, the nature of the self more generally and what is the self. And I noticed in your earliest, some of your earliest investigations of the self, you looked into masochism. I don't think a lot of people are aware of that line of research you did. You viewed masochism as an escape from self. And you wrote later in one of your books that you were kind of disappointed with, you thought that was going to be kind of the holy grail of understanding the self, but you actually realized that it wasn't the answer. thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that line of research. Okay. I don't know about the holy grail, but it uh, it did post- (laughs) You thought it'd be elucidating. You thought it at least (laughs) would be elucidating, right? Yeah. I was on sabbatical at the University of Texas, and I thought I'd, I'd published a book on identity and how people uh, decide who they are and so on. I thought, well, I would do another one 
on how people find meaning in life. This goes back to my time in philosophy. I sort of come up with a plan of let me pick the major philosophical problems and write social science books about them. So meaning of life, obviously, is a, a grand philosophical one. I say, well, social scientists has a lot, have a lot to contribute. Let me just read everything and see what it comes out. When, so I was just sort of looking around for interesting things to uh, read. And, and a couple of things that uh, made me this way. One was I thought, well, these people who engage in kinky sex or wanting to be tied up and spanked and stuff like that, that they must have really interesting lives. So I, I recall going over to the library at uh, Texas there, uh, spending a day or two. And pretty soon I realized that I was not going to learn much about the meaning of life uh, from <laughs> these people doing, doing weird sex. But what struck me is that this was a challenge to our theories of self. When we think of the self as you're trying to maximize esteem, uh, you're trying to maximize control, uh, and basically, you know, find pleasure and avoid pain. And these people systematically do the opposite. They want it to be humiliated, embarrassed. They want it to be deprived of control, sometimes very obviously tied up and rendered helpless and so on. And, of course, they, they accept pain rather than the pleasure. So I said, this goes exactly opposite of, of what we think about the self. How are we going to reconcile this? I have to figure this out. And after a while, I realized it, there wasn't going to be any magic resolution that uh, somehow the self really did have control or whatever underneath. That Red really doing these things was a way to get rid of the self, that the, the masochists embrace these things that are precisely contrary to the ordinary self as a way of getting out of their normal self. And that enables them to, uh, you know, there are several possible appeals of that. One is, you know, you forget yourself when it's stressful to be yourself over a long period of time. Perhaps it liberates you from inhibitions and so on and produces, you know, these sort of uh, sexual pleasures that they get out of it. So it was an interesting detour. And that whole project was done long before the Meaning of Life book ever got finished. It was the same with suicide. I'm going to write about Meaning of Life. I have to understand what causes suicide because that's people who've decided life doesn't have any meaning. And there's a lot more literature on suicide than on masochism. But as I uh, read through that, I realized, no, it's not a rejection of your whole life. Since it's not a life is meaningless thing, it's more that the present is intolerable and it's more an escape from this week. Uh, rather than from your life as a whole. So I had another paper sort of following up the masochism one on suicide. The suicide is escape from self. Masochism was very frustrating to work on because there was so little information that you know, could think of all these theoretical issues and questions. But you know, these people don't want to be studied, and there's just not much to find about the sexual masochists. Whereas uh, suicide, there are tons of studies. There are entire journals uh, going back decades. So, you know, not all the information is great, but there's at least information. Any question you want to formulate, you can probably find something to answer it. So, uh, to me, studying suicide was a very positive, happy experience. I know that sounds weird. And, you know, later went to a conference or two of suicide researchers, and for most of them, it's a personal thing. They knew somebody who killed self or, or whatever. I, I didn't know anybody who killed self. I didn't have any interest in it. For me, it was just an intellectual puzzle, and it was a very satisfying one to work on, and I was able to work out the escape from self theory much better than I could uh, dealing with the uh, kinky sex uh, stuff. But again, too, that uh, that was done and came out uh, long before the, the meaning of life stuff was all done. You raise a lot of things that you just talked about. One is a very interesting point about death as an escape from self. I mean, essentially that is, you know, we're the ones that make death such an event to ourselves because we hold our identity as the core of who we are. And so when that dies permanently, that's when we say it's the end of us. Right? If we were to get our arm cut off, we wouldn't say we're dead. But when we get our brain cut off, you know, people say we're dead, right? So <laughs> we don't say we're dead. Yes. But um, it's very interesting to think about, you know, where the self is located. Yeah, there's some interesting theoretical issues on this. There's the, uh, you know, Ernest Becker wrote The Denial of Death in the exactly. 70s and got a Pulitzer Prize or something, arguing that much of human life is motivated by this fear of our own mortality. And that several very bright social psychologists have developed this into a theory they call terror management. And they, they say that self-esteem is erected as a defense against death. And to me, that has never made sense because yourself is what dies when you die. 
Uh, so the more value you put on the self, the worse it makes death. It, it, it seems to go in the opposite direction, that if you really wanted to uh, get rid of the fear of death and cope with it, you should lower your self-esteem so that it's no big deal that you die. Indeed, as I was researching the meaning of life book, what I came to uh, perceive and, and conclude is that as our societies put more and more emphasis on the self as a source of value, it's creating a very fragile meaning of life. People used to get meaning of life. You draw meaning from something that has a broader context and a bigger time span. And the, you know, the standard advice for you want to increase the meaning of your life is get involved in something bigger than yourself. So it's presumably something that will last after you're gone, a religious or a political movement or a scientific or artistic you know, the idea that I will create something and this will live on after my life, that's what gives meaning. If you draw the meaning of your life from focusing on self, that makes you all that more vulnerable because when you die, your self dies. And people like to think they'll be remembered, but uh, the empirical evidence is people are not remembered uh, very long. I mean, most people can hardly come up with a few sentences about their grandparents and don't even know the names of their great grandparents. And so, you know, after you die, it's a little bit of a downer, I suppose, to reflect on this. But you know, after you die, the people who know you will remember you and think of you now and then. But the people who didn't know you will probably not give you another thought. And, and even, as I said, your grandchildren who were young when you're old, uh, they don't you know, they'll think about you about the way you think of your grandparents, which is, in most cases, not very deeply or often. I think about my grandparents a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, you may be fortunate to be tied into more of a family uh, sort of thing. But uh, for most people, their you know, grandparents are different people with different lives. And Sure. So you raise a good point because there is a study that came out recently showing that self-transcendence, like if you prime people to think of trans self-transcendent things, they do show reductions in terror management as opposed to thinking about the self. So there is a study experimentally proving that. Okay, that's a good point. Suggesting that is the case. So your point was a good point. <laughs> a good study supporting that point. So that is true. But the idea of the self, it's such a complicated question to ask, what is the self? We both would agree that it is a very fragmented thing. It's a very uh, multidimensional construct. But what is the association between our self and our identity? Are they the same thing? Is it unity? Okay, well, here we're getting into some difficult uh, uh, definitional issues. Uh, first of all, yeah, the self has lots of pieces and parts, but to say it's fragmented, yeah, sort of an essential feature of the self is unity. You have one self. And now the term self and identity are used in different ways by different people, and some use them almost interchangeably. But one way to make the distinction is sort of identity is the definition of the self. And, and so in a sense, that's your position in society. Your identity is your roles. It's uh, what other people would, uh, how they would characterize you. Whereas the self might be the psychological processes that produce it and uh, would include your self-concept. If you lived alone, you might have some self-concept. You wouldn't have much of an identity. I mean, if you, if you never met another person, you wouldn't even need a name. You wouldn't own anything. You wouldn't have a reputation. You know, a lot of the things that are really important central concerns for the self and the things that define your identity, which is who you are, is kind of the literal definition of identity. Those are all dependent on social interaction. As we said before, talking about my dissertation, one theme of my career is that a lot more things are based on interpersonal relations than we think. It's such a habit in psychology to think of one mind at a time. And that's what I came up against in my dissertation. People are thinking all these effects are due to changes in self-esteem and so on. I'm trying to say that. Well, and self-esteem may not matter much, but people care a lot about what other people uh, think of them. So the self, too, and identity is, is very much a tool for connecting with other people. It's what our species evolved to do, and it's our strategy for survival and reproduction. As, as social animals, we need to connect with others. We've come up with fairly elaborate social systems, much more than seen elsewhere in nature, but they depend on differentiated identities. Just one second, Roy. Hey, everyone. To keep this content free, we ask that you please support our sponsor, Bomboss, by going to bomboss.com backslash TPP and using our exclusive promo code TPP to get an exclusive 20% discount off your first order, along with a money-back guarantee. Bomboss recently sent the Psychology Podcast some of their high-quality socks to try out, and we think they're pretty cool. 
My personal favorite are the Americanos. They're red, white, and blue, with a really sporty patterning. Importantly, though, we're not just happy with their product. We're enthusiastic about their mission. Bombas donates one pair of socks to the homeless for every pair purchased, and we think that's just great. They have a counter on their website and have already donated over 2,200,000 socks. We talk a lot about the value of philanthropy and compassion on this show, so we're happy to welcome a sponsor that is doing its part to ameliorate the lives of people in need. So again, go to bombas.com backslash TPP and use our exclusive code TPP to get a discount. Now back to the show. Roy, I don't feel like we ever really defined what the self is. You know, I take your point that the self is, it feels unitary. But what I meant by fragment is it, it is actually comprised of lots of different, sometimes contradictory processes. And, and a lot of people throughout the history of psychology have talked about the importance of integrating these various selves, so to speak, to have optimal human functioning. So what is the self, though? Again, the trying to come up with a definition is one of the uh, hardest things. I think the self is not a thing. It's not a piece of the brain, but rather it's, it's more of a process of performance. You know, you talk about the different parts. Yeah, integration is, in a sense, the last step. The self comes into being bottom up. And, uh, you know, the brain doesn't even have a central processing unit. It just does things separately. The brain doesn't really need a self. And a, like a solitary organism doesn't be on limited degrees either. The, it's a requirement of complex social systems. We have a review article coming out uh, in a fairly soon, Brain Behavioral Sciences. We looked through all the, the group's literature. Uh, Sometimes human groups are more than the sum of their parts and sometimes less. And we tried to say, what's the moderator? What makes the difference? And the conclusion was groups function well when people are individually identified and participate as separate individuals. Uh, when people all blend into the group, then the groups that produces the bad effects like mob violence and deindividuation and not helping and social loafing and all those negative things. So human groups really do better with differentiated selves. The requirement to be a unique individual doesn't come from inside the person. It comes from the social system. Now, we evolved to make those systems work, and, and they do bring, uh, bring immense benefits so when, when we, we take part in them. But the self, the, you know, the brain operates an identity in the social group. You know, that's how the self comes into being. As I said, it's a process of performance. It's not a thing. You're such a social psychologist. <laughs> well, thanks. I... It's funny to hear, you know, because like you could hear a different perspective from someone who like just studies the brain or someone who like a cognitive psychologist or individual well, it's, differences. Psychologist. It's in, the uh, cognitive and the brain people are sometimes skeptical that there is such a thing as a self. There's a hefty uh, tradition running through them saying the self is an illusion, but they can't find any particular piece of the brain. You know, they study all these little processes and subroutines. I had a reviewer once on a paper saying, it's really, this is a profound comment that's stuck with me ever since, obviously. It's instructive to look at which disciplines need the self and which are skeptical of it. And the ones just looking at the inner workings of the mind and the parts, they're not so sure there's such a thing as a self or it's some, like I said, some of them call it an illusion and so on. But you couldn't do economics or sociology without identities. And economics, what's the point of buying something if you don't have the self to own it next week? Right. What's the point of selling something if you don't have a self to uh, get the money and use it for something else that the self wants? So the assumption of continuity of identity and of selfhood is indispensable for the, the disciplines that study social systems uh, for the ones that go down into the individual mind, well, uh, you know, then, then it's not so important. And to me, that's a profound point, that the need for the self arises in interpersonal relations, not in terms of the requirements of the single mind. Great. I find that very interesting. I also find it very interesting that you said that the brain does not require the self. And that is clearly illustrated when we're dreaming. Because well, when we're dreaming, we certainly don't have an identity, right? I mean, but does that mean we're dead? I'm when not we're sure yeah. that's true. I mean, you have a dream which has yourself in it. Okay. We don't have self-reflection, I guess. Yeah. Or not in, not in the same way. It's a, the unconscious mind constructs a little scenario and you know, makes sense out of stimuli. It you know, makes a story. That, you know, story making is one of the basic activities of the, the human mind, and dreams are a version of that. So you think the identity is still involved in dream formation? 
Yes, I think so. I mean, again, without participation of the conscious self, these are things I don't have a, a full grasp on yet. But mm. certainly in a dream, you wake up, you know, you write down your dream. There's I, I did this. and But that's a reconstruction. That. Yeah, but the point is it was there in the dream, the difference between you and someone else. Typically, you're dreaming about yourself doing something, being in some situation. You don't dream about and people you never met or heard of or other things going on. Maybe some people do occasionally, but uh, most, usually people are in their own dreams. And so there is at least the fact of self-identity, uh, it is used there. You don't have all the control that you have in an ordinary life to make decisions and take responsibility and strange things happen. That's certainly in dreams. But there is a, the basic idea of I know who I am. You know, that's still there in the dream. Very interesting. Okay, it's a good point. It's a good point. Let's move on to the meanings of life. Something that was really seminal, and we're moving from one like huge topic to another huge, I mean, these are not really light topics, are they? Death, self, you go big or go home, right? Yeah, um, sorry, Faker, yeah. Yeah, but with the, the meanings of life, you know, something that was very seminal in your work was differentiating between happiness and meaning, saying we also have this striving for meaning in life. And obviously, you're not the only one to say that, you know, Viktor Frankl, said it as well and his idea of will to meaning. But you came up with four needs for meaning. And I thought you could maybe just talk about the four. Okay. Well, Franco was a genius. He was the first one to dare to bring the idea of meaning and meaning of life into psychology. Uh, for him, it was pretty much about purpose. You know, when he talks about meaning, it's having a purpose. And he started with his observations in concentration camps and I went on to study people and so on. So purpose was there. And a purpose is, is certainly a big aspect of meaning of life. So uh, to me, that was one of the four needs for meaning. And I would have been happy if that explained everything. But as I read endless amounts of stuff to try to uh, put together that book, I wanted to say, okay, what is it that a person needs and wants when you were looking for a meaning of life? So purpose is one, but just having a purpose wasn't enough. Uh, I seem there also has to be some sense of right and wrong, some basic values is some way even to justify yourself so that you think you are a, a good person and right. And, you know, if you have a purpose, but it's uh, you know, associated with something bad or whatever, that, that, that's not fully satisfactory. And then I thought two more came in uh, after a while. The third is efficacy. You have to believe you can make a difference. You know, having a purpose is not going to make your life meaningful if there's nothing you can do to fulfill that purpose. So... You know, apart from having the idea that this is the purpose of my life, it's also there has to be something I can do to make that true, to advance that, to reach those goals, to achieve fulfillment, to get to heaven, to uh, provide for my children or whatever uh, the purpose is. So some sense of efficacy. And then thinking again about self-esteem and so on, some basis for thinking that you're a person of value, of worth, and that's also implicated. With those four, I think people who have a, a purpose that they're striving for, who have a strong sense of what's right and wrong, of value, uh, who feel some efficacy of being able to make a difference in life in a positive way, and who have some basis for thinking that they're a worthwhile person. For them, life is pretty meaningful. Uh, for people who don't have those things, uh, well, I think they have a problem with meaning of life and will tend to say, no, things don't make sense. My life is not meaningful. But something to uh, address each of those four basic needs. Sure. And you also argue that there is a myth of higher meaning, of there being a higher meaning. Can you tell me why that's a myth? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well... You like that uh, question. You like that question. <laughs> yes, yes. A lot of things develop in a bottom-up fashion. I mean, we said this about the self, you know, that you have different responses and so on, but to integrate them into a single self is a gradual process that perhaps never becomes complete. And a lot of a lot of reality is like that, and biologically it makes a sense. That's that's how we evolve. So with meaning, we like to think you know, there's one explanation that will all fit together. The process of constructing meaning is is gradually putting things and integrating them, and so on. And you know, like to imagine eventually it will all all come together and all make sense. There's no guarantee that that's true, but it's an appealing idea. So you know, people ask, "What is the meaning of life?" as if there's going to be a, a single uh, answer or a, one formula that explains and integrates everything. Whereas, in fact, it struck me that the meaning of most people's lives is 
something stitched together out of several unrelated things. They have their family and romantic uh, relationships and one, and they have their work, and, and those may or may not be related. They may be quite separate, and they may have their religious faith, which is uh, yet another thing, or other sources of meaning, and people might have hobbies and other activities. So the idea that even one person's life, that there is a single meaning to it, that's probably not right, or at least doesn't fit the data. But that faith, I see signs of it. People think it's all going to make sense and all going to come together. So that's what I meant by the, uh, the myth of higher meaning, that uh, eventually we'll get to a place where you know, we can understand it all. But I'm not sure we will. Yeah, even with a single life, there's so many events in a particular life. You can write the most perfect, exquisite biography, but it's not going to include every thing that you did in your life and the, the time you got lost and you're looking for the Department of Motor Vehicles or the time you had the flu and you know, vomited in the, in the living room. Sure. Uh, you know, those are uh, a meaning of life. There's a stitched together integration, picking out some highlights. I'm particularly interested when the same person writes several different autobiographies that, that you know, at how do they reinterpret and reconstruct their life and they take some things out and add new things in and even going back that write your autobiography as a young adult and then later maybe you have some big religious awakening or a political conversion or something. You would write a new autobiography and when stuff that happened when you were a childhood that might have been left out of the first biography is sort of out of the way. Suddenly that might become central and important as the, you know, the first steps that the integration wasn't there till later. Meaning is basically connection. Meaning as in everything from meaning of life to the meaning of a sentence or the meaning of a word. It connects things in a non-physical way. It's not molecule to molecule, but it's a, a more of a symbolic connection. That's why meaning comes in, in, in webs and structures and, and clusters. So as we're talking about constructing a meaning of life, we're talking about putting things together and integrating things. And you can do that to a greater and greater extent if you think a great detail about your life. But you're probably never going to get it all in the same story. You're not going to come up with one, one meaning. That so makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that does make sense. And we may have multiple purposes throughout our lives or feel there's multiple things in our life that have whole different meaning at different points in our lives. So that speaks to this, yeah, against this notion of there being a single higher meaning, like a higher superordinate meaning that, that transcends our whole life that we need a better whole life searching for. So I, th I think that makes sense. Well, thank God. <laughs> uh, just kidding. It's a little uh, bit yeah. of... <laughs> I, I came on this rather roundabout, so, I, you know, but the, the idea is in... It's a much messier theory that I came up with, and I like clean, elegant theory, so it's too bad. But sometimes that's the way reality is, that if there were a meaning of life that you could pick one person and say, okay, the meaning of your life is blah, 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 and say it in one sentence, that would be, that would be lovely and elegant. But more it's a matter of, do you have, what are the purposes you strive for? What are the basis for knowing what's right and wrong? And how do you justify what you're doing? Do you have efficacy? Do you have self-worth? You might have several different schemes or uh, aspects of your life that satisfy different ones of those. But if you've got them all covered one way or another, you probably think life is meaningful, even if they don't all fit into a single meaning. That's right. But ultimately, meaning comes from uh, what other people find you doing. Like, if other people find what you're doing meaningful, that's meaning. You know, it's funny, we measure in positive psychology, we have self-report scales of meaning. <laughs> and it's kind of silly in a way that like, we're measuring whether you have meaning based on your self-reported. Like, what if like what you're doing does not offer meaning to anyone else in your environment? Is you know like, and then you die. Was there meaning? Do you know what I mean? I think I know what you mean, and mm. you're bringing up another point again: the the interpersonal that uh, we're not solitary, self-contained units, and meaning is connection, and some of that invokes interpersonal connection. So. It's possible to be quite deluded and have a meaning for your life that nobody else can see. You might think you're a great artist or something, and everybody else takes one look at your paintings and says, oh, get me out of here. But then I guess that's how they reacted to Van Gogh. And uh, you know, later he was, you know, people judged to be one of the great geniuses of all time. Sometimes the one's own meaning is, is right, but more often it requires validation from others. And you think you're good, good at something and nobody else thinks so. The odds are... Others are all right, and you're not. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think that it'd be good to develop measures of meaning that survey your community, <laughs> your mm 
your peers, yeah. your friends, your everyone, yeah. and not just yourself. Yeah. Actually, Tom Stoppard made this point in a Q&A he had with the philosopher David Chalmers. Someone asked him about meaning, and he said, how can I ever assess meaning? That's for other people to assess about me. Anyway, so it just made me, you know, I, I thought that was a really good point. Well, I'm a big fan of his, but in empirical fact, people do assess the meaning sure. of their life. They may be wrong, which may be <laughs> his point, but they, they right. certainly are able to do it. Right. But it suggests, what are they responding to? Really, a spread of these studies where the dependent variable is they'll have college students rate on a 12-point scale or whatever, how meaningful is their life. We don't really know what goes into them saying yes or no. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, my life has gobs of meaning. Right. But uh, I think the next generation of research, we need to push them a little farther and say, okay, what exactly does your life mean? Can you articulate what this meaning is? Uh, meaningfulness you know, might just be a feeling. If it, something seems emotionally rich, maybe that is enough to seem meaningful and uh, sway people into that. But is that really an answer or not? All right. And well, you've done great work differentiating happiness from meaning and meaning being a key difference is this integrative complexity from your past, your future, yeah. and your present. So maybe when people are coming up with that sort of judgment, they're trying to integrate all these three levels of time. Yeah, the meaning and happiness thing, uh, clearly happiness is part of the meaning. That was incidentally one, I thought, I'm going to research my book on meaning of life, I'll have to read the literature on happiness. And that did get in, that, that's clearly there. It's being happy and having meaningful life are not the same thing, but there's certainly some overlap. Sure. It's, you can be you have a meaningful life without being very happy, but I'm not sure about the reverse, that you can be really happy if you find your life meaningless. That I'd rather doubt. Right. So even if you live an entirely hedonistic lifestyle, it's still likely that you'll find meaning in that, right? I mean, you would say that's what I'm kind of here for in a way. Yeah, I wish we had more studies on people who actually do that and what they think and feel. And do they rationalize? Do they come up with at least meaningful constructions or... Are they able to say, I'm just here to eat candy, take drugs, masturbate, I don't know, and just going for the pleasure from day to day? Conventional wisdom, which is probably right on this, is that living a purely hedonistic life doesn't satisfy you in the long run, which uh, would uh, Victor Frankl's point that uh, we need something more. We need, we need meaning, too. There are also some studies suggesting that you pursue happiness for its own sake. And the pursuit of happiness, of course, is one of the founding American ideals. You know, pursuing happiness for your own sake doesn't really work. Right. But if you try to cultivate a meaningful life, that can work, and that will make you then happy too. So if it's what I said, you know, meaning is more of a prerequisite for happiness, uh, not so much the other way around. Excellent point. Stay tuned, everyone, for next week for part two of this two-part series with Roy. Again, this episode was sponsored by Bomboss. Check out their website, bomboss.com backslash TPP, and use the code TPP to get an exclusive 20% discount off your first order. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast with Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman. I hope you found this episode just as thought-provoking and interesting as I did. If you'd like to read the show notes for this episode or hear past episodes, you can visit thepsychologypodcast.com.